in a world with high social tensions, increasing inequality, and a decline in average well-being. I know that you want to talk. You just have to wait a little bit. Because you are the parliamentarian, of course, so you can tell us a little bit from the inside. But I think that we might also remember that when we ask the question, what should we do, most of us tend to point to someone else. You know, not us. Mm. So I'm just going to let to go to start with Perespin, and then I will end with you, and and take that as a starting point. How do we do this? Well, first, <clears throat> first, I have to ask Jurgen to stop speaking about a stronger state because that's what people pick up. Rather, you should speak about an active, smarter state that is more effective in implementing mm. the regulations you want. So the second point is that we do this primarily by focus on inequality, and that's the question to me I'd like to answer. And that is, um, Piketty's point in terms of new capitalism is not to increase taxation on wealth. That's the wrong framing. Mm -hmm. It's actually to reduce the taxation on wealth for most people. <laughs> <laughs> the view that capitalism can be tempered you know, by a tax rate of 80% on wage income supplemented by a modest tax on net wealth is not necessarily very radical. It's the extreme wealth of the top wealth holders that provide the f little funds we need. It's only an issue of 2 to 4% of the GDP, and the wealth of the ultra high net worth individuals represents in the order of 50%. So it's like a little, little, little tiny slice of the top wealth needed to solve it. And when somebody, people say these are, it's impossible, I disagree. Thanks. Thank you. Something. Yeah, maybe I'll build on that several points. One is absolutely it is possible because we have most of the tools in the toolbox. We really do. I mean, the capital is there. We know we can shift the perversities in the market. And we know that actually with politicians and decision makers that come back to what real leadership means, which is servicing people, planet and prosperity rather than themselves, we can do this. So for me, the real problem here is the leadership gap. And then when we get to, do we then need a stronger state? I'm exactly on the same point as Per Espen. This is, the problem is language. And even the fact that Piketty uses the word capitalism. I think we need to stop using the word capitalism in the same way that we need to stop using the word communism at a time when actually, maybe we call it complexitism, which needs a totally different type of governance model. And that comes back to leadership, as I said, for people, planet, and prosperity, servicing that through a financial and economic system that puts in place a value-based framework that places a value, and some would say, okay, we could call it capital, then you would call it human capital, natural capital, and economic capital equally. So having actually looked at different types of government models, we do need a strong state, but that includes leadership for people, planet, and prosperity, not a dictatorship for oneself. I can feel some tensions running from <laughs> years of discussion in this group. Very good. You, what are your comments? Yes, so uh, I agree that a strong state is, is going to be important. Um, but a strong state can be many things in a way. And um, I guess different types of strong states can actually do different things. I mean, um, I would say that Norway has a fairly strong state, but also mm -hmm. China has a strong state. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, China, I mean, there are many bad things to say about China, but they are closer to doing something about the problem than many other countries, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and I mean, weak states that cannot do anything is, are not going to help anything, and I think that is going to be a big challenge. Uh, so my view uh, of what we need to get a well, state to be sufficiently strong to do something is, I think, the question of trust in the government, that uh, the, the, the large majority of the people actually believe that the government is mostly doing things that are more or less good for most of us. Mm. Um, and I think if you go out asking Norwegians, most of them well, they will say that uh, Gai is whatever, but uh, in general, uh, the government does reasonably good things. 
Uh, if you go ask uh, Americans, they would most of them would think that the government in uh, Washington is doing crap. Mm -hmm. um, so, so only, I mean, that's still a quite democratic country, but mm -hmm. they don't have any trust in their government. Uh, and I think if you go to most African countries, they would say that uh, all the politicians are corrupt, corrupt essentially. <laughs> uh, so, so they have no trust. And if you have a government where nobody trusts you, how can you expect them to do anything good? So that, of course, begs the question, how do you build trust in the government? Mm. Um, and well, having politicians who actually do something good, so fighting corruption and the like, might be a way to start. Uh, but at least making sure that um, politicians and the government tries to at least, to some extent, listen to the, to the population, I think is uh, a requirement to, to, to getting some people to mm. trust them. Mm. So that's at least some of my views. Mm. There's a lot of nodding going on. Mm -hmm. um, I think that many of the things that you mentioned, we actually see at least the rudiments off here and there. There are governance systems that are actually developing. There's lots of, of focus on building trust and making networks and having more and, uh, and more sort of commitment into the international relations that we do. And the trouble, of course, with when you mentioned the Russian invasion of Ukraine is that when push comes to shove, it is difficult to hold on to these new and yep. hopefully better ways of thinking, which is very heavily illustrated in the situation that we are right now and that we will hear more about, I think, when Yara comes on later and talks about how the uh, fertilizer industry is doing. <laughs> um, so, Jürgen, we have now managed to carve out two and a half minutes to you, <laughs> <laughs> where you will tell us, what do you think? Uh, okay. <laughs> so what I was going to tell is that uh, I am 76. I was 25 when I heard Aurelio Pache give the flaming, very eloquent talk, just like Sandrine at this point in time. That's 50 years ago. Meanwhile, I have been behaving decently. <laughs> Try at least, you know, being in favor of not speaking about elephants in the room, but rather speaking about those things that have political uh, credibility. Uh, I've been taught by my wife that I should never, ever, ever mention that I'm in favor of China, and that I should, of course, absolutely never say that I really believe in a government where the intelligent and educated and informed people make decisions on behalf of the rest mm. for their benefit, not for their own benefit, but for the benefit of the majority. Uh, it's now 10 years ago, after 40 years of struggling, I gave up and started <laughs> talking about China <laughs> and about strong government and about the need to do something beyond what is uh, recommended by neoclassical macro and beyond what is recommended by all the people who believe that democracy with short-term voters is a better way of government than what I think is a better way, namely that you delegate some of the important decisions to people who know something about it rather than uh, for the rest. This is done with great success in the United States they have put in place a Supreme Court that defends the Constitution. The Constitution is a piece of paper with a lot of crap. It, they have built an institution around it that defends it. They have done so for 200 years, and that is working well for those people that believe in the Constitution. It does not work well for me who do not like most of the stuff that is in the American Constitution. So my conclusion in the end is that what we need to do is to find some way of countering the short-term nature of the human being, mm. either manifested in modern democracies or manifested in the market. There are these two institutions that we use when we try to talk about the problem, and they have one common problem. They are very unable to get in place things in the short term in order to create a better world for the majority on a 30 to 60 year horizon. So are there solutions to that problem? And in my mind, yes, there is. 
the, in our part of the world, it would be to typically take the parliament, put in place a supreme, so they gather, they select 10 of them, put them into a supreme court that defends future generations. And you can start by giving them the authority to ban, overrule any decision by the parliament, which leads to higher greenhouse gas emissions. So you start simple, then you can add on the other stuff uh, way on. And then finally, I would like to say that, as you said, if you try to look at the world to see whether anyone has actually managed to remove poverty, to increase the standing of women, you know, to put in place a system which increases the well-being of the vast majority, it is the Chinese authority, you know, with 90 million people in the party making decisions on behalf of the 1.4 billion others, and in 40 years have eight doubled the income of you know, 1.4 billion Chinese, while we have been speaking about how to develop Sri Lanka. So it is, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, very nice. So uh, that is the end. What I was asked to talk about was something else, which are the <laughs> main discussion points inside the group.